Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for blessing us with your word today. And I'm glad, Lord, that uh, we can go in to see your hand of grace and mercy upon the man who is willing to hear and respond to your call. I pray we would be those, Lord, today that would hear and respond. That you would minister to us today through your word. Encourage us. Strengthen us. And we ask your blessing on this service now. Give us ears to hear, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, we left off again on a kind of a sad note as the Lord was telling Noah that he was pretty well done with the corruptness of man. Men had become so wicked and evil in their heart that the the Lord responded that the end of all flesh had come before him. And he said that the earth was filled with violence. And so he had made a decision to destroy the earth. It's nice to pick up today. And he said, but I mentioned that before, those great but gods kind of in the word. And here's one of those. The Lord says, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall go into the ark. You, your sons, your wife and your son's wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creepy thing on the earth. That's creeping, but I call them creepy because anything creeps is creepy. Every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. Now here is the first time that the word covenant is used in the Word of God. It will be used several more times Uh, quite frequently in the Old Testament, about 253 times and another 20 times in the New Testament. Now, what is a covenant? Well, I want to start with what it is not. A covenant is not a contract. See, when you have two parties that make a contract together, they are agreeing to terms within the contract. And the way a contract is established is if one party breaks the contract, breaks the terms of the contract, the contract's null and void. Well, a covenant is far more serious than that. Now, as a contract, a covenant is an agreement between two or more parties. And within the covenant, it is agreed upon what the mutual rights and what the mutual responsibilities of the parties might be. But these are not to be broken. There is no breaking of a covenant. Today, God has established marriages under a covenant, not a contract. So in God's house, when two Christians are married, you're being married under the terms that is not to be broken. Now, certainly we know there are people who do. Uh, They walk away from the Lord. They walk away from their family. They walk away from uh, the responsibilities that they have. In a contract, you have parties that break. And if they do break their end of the contract, then the contract's null and void. So we have that idea today that in marriages, that if one party doesn't do what I uh, want them to do or what they promised that they would do, well, that's it. Then it's all over with. And, and so we have these prenuptial kind of things, these contracts. Most of them are geared around finances, obviously. You hear about that quite often with uh, the rich sports figures and with movie stars and such. But it can even carry over to all sorts of things. I've recently seen a court issue where Fifi and Fido were being argued over by the couple and they were going to fight to see who gets possession of their animals even. And so that's all laid out in contracts before they even get married. And it's just it's crazy. But that's what the world has gone to. There is no such belief from the world's point of view in a covenant, something that would be governed by God. And so here God makes his first covenant with man. And when God makes a covenant with man, he's never going to break that promise. And we're going to see that God here is faithful to the covenant that he makes with Noah. In this world, you will find courts filled with people who want to argue and fight over these things. But there is no breaking of a covenant with God. I had a next door neighbor and uh, 
he and I used to challenge the kids to basketball games, and they would challenge us. And we both had one of those portable basketball things out in front of our house. And oftentimes the kids would come and challenge us, you know, to two on two, you know, and we'd play to 21 or whatever the the thing is. And we would set up basically some rules of how the game's going to go before we start. Well, he was notorious. He's one of these kind of guys that just can't stand to lose. Maybe you're one of those kind of people. And and, uh, you get in the middle of the game, you start to go down and... And it just, you know, you're not even happy to be around anymore. You know, you're just a miserable person. And if you lose the game, then, you know, you're this dark cloud follows you for two or three days. Well, he was one of those kind of guys. He just couldn't stand to lose. Well, he has a little more leverage when it's your kids that you're playing against, you know. And they were, it started off, we started when they were probably nine or ten years old, we would do this. But through the years, we would get to where they were getting better and better and better. So in the beginning, it was like no problem. We would... You know, we'd clean their clock pretty easily at 9 or 10. But when they got to be 16 or 17 and 18, you know, that age, they would clean our clock. And so what he would do is in the middle of the game, he'd start changing the rules. And all of a sudden, well, this is good for us and then we get extra things for this. And, and he would do whatever he could to change the rules. And they would get so frustrated with him. Because he would lay down the law. This is how the rules are going to be, you know, because he would hate to lose a game. And so finally, as much as he changed the rules, it didn't matter anymore because they still claimed our clock and we couldn't beat them. But, you know, in the end, he lost out on that. But aren't you glad that God doesn't change the rules on us? There are a lot of religions that teach that he does. That halfway through history, all of a sudden, God's got a new rule, and this is how it's going to be. Salvation's going to now come through this method. And that was only revealed to this prophet. And so, everyone that wants to be saved, now you have to do it by this add-on that we've put in our book, you know. But God doesn't do that. He doesn't change how He sets standards. He doesn't change how He governs uh, the nature and the, the workings of our world. God says what He means, and He means what He says. Now, what were the terms of this particular covenant that He made with Noah? Very, very simple. He just simply said, you shall go into the ark. That isn't a tough one there, folks. All you got to do is just go into the ark. And yet all these people didn't want to have anything to do with the ark. The ark was a neighborhood eyesore. It was a mockery. The Daily Press was out there with their cameras taking pictures of it and making fun of Noah while he was building this. Believe in the Lord. Be willing to obey the Lord. And he'll save you from the flood. It was, it was that simple. Anyone who would believe and turn from their wicked ways. But no one did. It was just Noah and his own family that were willing to do this. Now, many people today don't like to play by God's rules. There are a lot who think that God must be willing to change the rules for them so that they can get into heaven on their own terms. I love it when they say, well, I've got this... Uh, agreement with God. Oh, really? You know, like you laid down the rules of how heaven's going to accept you and God just went, oh, okay, I, I want you so badly, I'll change everything for you. And people think that God is going to make those kind of changes. But God establishes the rules and changes them for no one. This isn't Monty Hall and this isn't Let's Make a Deal. And if you don't like door number one, well, I'll just go for door number two or door number three. That isn't how it works. To ignore the conditions that God has laid for our salvation, that Jesus Christ dying on the cross was not necessary for you, and that's not the only way into heaven, well, that line of thinking isn't going to sit well with God because He sent His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's not any other way into heaven, but through His Son. In verse 21, you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten. Lots of different food out there that were provided for man in the garden. And you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. So they were going to be needing enough food to last a whole year. And we think that that is probably quite a bit of food when you think about that. But many believe that God caused by a miracle these animals to go into a hibernation like bears. 
And that would make some sense if the Lord would do something like that. It would sure make Noah's job a whole lot easier in cleaning up and feeding these animals and having to clean up after them. And it would keep the bear and the lion and the elephant from getting at each other a lot easier too and keep the noise down. So there is that possibility. There's no evidence of that. I can't verify it, but it makes sense. Now, I know that when the first time I went over to Russia... Uh, they allowed us like a 65 pound uh, of uh, luggage that you could put underneath. And I filled my luggage to 65 pounds. We had a scale. And I'll tell you, if I could put one more sock in there, that sock was in there. You had to sit on that luggage to zip it shut. And we had everything we could absolutely carry in there. And you'd think that we were going across country, you know, and uh, living for 14 years with, a, with what we were trying to take. Well, after you've been over there the first time, you realize, you know what? I don't change these clothes nearly as much as I think I'm going to. And so you start traveling a whole lot lighter. And by the third trip over, you know, we're down to like 45 pounds of luggage. And uh, even that, we probably had space in the suitcases. But you imagine trying to prepare yourself when you've never done this before, to prepare enough food for a year on board an ark to feed you and your whole family and all of these animals. That must have been quite a task for him. Thus Noah did, verse 22, according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Boy, that's a neat scripture you don't want to miss. With all the wickedness that was going on in the world, this one man, Noah, it says, did all that God commanded him to do. And that's truly amazing because we often will hear people, and maybe you even feel that way yourself, that it's just not easy to be a Christian today. It's a difficult task to try to live for the Lord. But here is a man who had nothing but wickedness all about him, and yet he stood faithful to the Lord, and all that God had called him to do, he was faithful to do it. That's an amazing thing. Now we enter into chapter 7 as he finish up that whole chapter of chapter 6. And we see the actual event come to pass. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all of your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. So here, in just these first six chapters, now entering in the seventh chapter, we have traveled through hundreds of years, from the beginning of time of man, all the way through the generations now up until uh, the age of Noah, which we'll read in a few verses here, that he is now 600 years old. And in this time, Noah has been faithfully building this ark, and he's also been equally faithful at preaching the word of God to the ungodly. That's a long time. Now, some of us have been preaching to family members. Some of us have been praying for friends and next door neighbors and so and. You know, a year has gone by or two years and we just kind of had thrown up our hands and said, forget it. You know, this guy, he's going to be the one that is not going to come to the Lord. And we give up on those family members, but yet we shouldn't. You don't know when they're finally going to buckle in and allow the Lord to come into their heart. Some of you are, are probably feeling like you were that person yourself. You waited a lot of years. You had a lot of praying going on for you, but you finally buckled in. And we need to be faithful to continue to build as God leads us to build what He has given us, stay at the tasks that God's given us to do, and also to use the opportunities to share with the ungodly around us. Now, notice in chapter 7 that it begins with an invitation. That's an interesting way to begin this. The Lord did not say to Noah, Go, get up and go into the ark. But instead, the Lord says, come into the ark. And it appears to me that God is in the ark himself. And he's inviting Noah to come in. Now, that's so great to look at it on those kind of terms, because I believe in the generation of man that we're in chapter seven. I think we're looking at the end days right now, the days just before the wrath of God is going to be poured out on this world. And I can hear the voice of the Lord to many people. I can still hear His voice saying, Come, come into the ark. In the same way the Lord is with us, He's always inviting man to come on in, inviting him to that place of protection, a place that will save him from the wrath that's to come. Now, it's so neat to know that we don't become Christians and God then leaves us to stand alone until His return. 
There are a lot of people who think that God kind of just placed you here and just took his hands off the world and says, all right, go for it. Do what you want to do. Well, that isn't what God has done. And it certainly isn't what God has done in the church. He doesn't just make you a Christian and then say, all right, you're on your own to live for God. And hopefully you'll just make it when I return. You'll, you'll still be walking with me. But the Lord invites you to come. And He wants to warm, uh, uh, have you warm yourself next to Him. And that's how we should be as a church then. Inviting people to come in. Inviting and being warm towards them. Providing a place of security and safety. Oftentimes, we've heard it said that the church becomes a hotel for saints. And we don't want the sinner to come in. When in reality, the church should be a hospital for the sinner. And so if you want us four and no more, you found the wrong church. You know, go find some other one. If you want everyone to dress a certain way and act a certain way, if you want to protect your family for, from what might, uh, that element might be that comes in and sits next to you, well, there are churches that will do that. But I want to see people that are out on these streets come to Jesus Christ. And the only way that's going to happen is for them to be exposed to the love of God. And so we need to reach out and make this a place comfortable for the sinner to enter in. Not comfortable in the sense that we're not going to preach the gospel, but comfortable in the sense that we're not going to judge them by the way they dress or act when they come in. It was Jesus who said, Come unto me, all you that are weary and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Do you have that heart towards the unbeliever around you? Come. Jesus says, Come. Are you one that says, come to the sinner, that you'll be one that helps provide and be as Christ, that you'll help the weary, the heavy laden? He also says in John chapter 7, verse 37, if any man thirst, let him come unto me. So that invitation of coming is always there. And as a church, we need to have that same invitation to those who don't know Christ. For 2,000 years since Christ first gave that invitation, that message has not changed. That's so awesome to know. Christ is our ark that's willing to carry us through. In verse 2, you shall take with you seven of each clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female, also seven each of birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of the earth. Have you ever wondered... How Noah got all these animals into the ark. I get this picture kind of as a, you know, a cattle rancher where, you know, he's out there maybe on the back of an ostrich with a stick, you know, chasing animals, you know, up the ramp up into the ark or something, you know, and he's got his little spur, homemade spurs on or something, you know. But I, I don't think that was the case at all. I think we're not told how the animals got into the ark, but it's not a difficult task for the Lord to just call them in and they would respond. I don't believe that Noah had to spend a bunch of time rounding all these animals up. I think the Lord took care of that problem. God never seems to really have problems getting the plant world or the animal world to respond to Him. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 19, it says that God brought the animals to Adam to name each one. Adam didn't have to go around the garden with little binoculars looking for certain species of birds and things. And going, oh, well, there's, I'm going to name that this, you know. God brought these animals before him. And so it is that it seems that man is more often the stubborn beast, the uncooperative with God more than the animal. So I think maybe we made a mistake in calling the mule a mule. Maybe the man should have been named the mule. Because in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3, it says, The ox knows its owner and the donkey knows its master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people, my own people, he says, do not consider. Isn't that a shame? That man, God's most loved, is the one that rebels against him. Said the robin to the sparrow, I would really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, Friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly Father such as cares for you and me. There's a pointed poem, isn't it? We are the ones that are rushing around and concerned and worried and freaking out over things when it is God who has promised 
that He will never leave us and He'll never forsake us. It's amazing. Now, when Noah and his family got out of the ark, they began to make their home on dry land, and we'll read about this in a few chapters here. And they're going to begin to sacrifice to God once again. So in order for them to keep the species alive, there were seven of certain kind of clean animals. Now remember, sacrifices could not be made with an unclean animal of any kind. So the unclean animals, there would be two, a male and a female. If you took the unclean animal and sacrificed it, well, now what are we going to do? Either the guy or the gal's missing, and that's the only way you're going to keep a species going. So there were seven of clean various animals that they could use for the sacrifices when they were able to get back on ground and establish the worship of the Lord again. In verse 4, For after seven more days... I will cause it to rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. Now, numbers in the Scriptures are symbolic. We'll read that as we continue through uh, the Scripture, the Old Testament, or in the New Testament. Seven is actually the number of completeness. So we'll read in the Scripture on the days of creation that there were seven days, and the seventh day God rested. He is finished. It was done. It was a completed picture of what He wanted to do. Seven days completes a week. Forty is the number of judgment in Scripture. You'll read uh, here particularly that there's, it's going to rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. But the Israelites, if you remember, how long did they wander through the wilderness? This for 40 years. When Jesus was being tempted and tested, he was taken out into the wilderness and he was tested for 40 days. So you will see these numbers appearing throughout the scripture as we continue on. But Noah, it says, did according once again to all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were on the earth. So once we again, we read of Noah's faithfulness. So Noah with his sons, his wife and his sons' wives, went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of the clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds, and of everything that creeps on the earth, two by two they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, And notice how precise this is now with the numbers. In the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all of the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. I think it's significant to see here that for seven days, the rains did not come. I believe that Noah had rounded up all the animals. They were on board the boat and Noah was on board the boat and his family was on board. And I believe that for those seven days, God gave man that opportunity once again. You just wonder what must have been going on. Certainly the people of the city must have known. They, did, they heard the hammering had stopped. They had seen the animals being put on board the boat. They probably thought, all right, This day that he has been dreaming of and preaching of, it's here. And so they were checking it out. I wonder if any of them came up to the boat and started yelling into Noah, Hey, what happened? Uh, Don't feel any rain around here. Maybe knocking on the boat. Hey, Noah, what's going on? There's no rain out here, Noah. And I wonder in that time, but at the end of seven days, the knocking and the mocking towards at least Noah was going to stop. It finally happened. The day of judgment came. Now, not only did the rains come, but it says here that the earth opened up. Now, there was this probably this huge earthquake opening the earth where water could come gushing out. Now, I don't know if there was a tsunami mentioned here or anything, but quite possible that was part of the picture here. Flood waters rising from the deep and also the windows of heaven opening. Now, what do you think the people were thinking when that rain began? At first, were they thinking, oh, this is just a coincidence? Or were they starting to really freak out? Well, I thought about this, and you know what? I don't think they did either one. 
I think they continued to have a hardened heart. And I gather that from chapter 6, verse 11, it's talked about the earth was so corrupt before God that all the earth was filled with violence. Not one man's heart in all those years of Noah's preaching, not one man softened his heart to the things of the Lord. In fact, what I have found, when man refuses the call of God on their life, when he first starts that prick in your heart, and you don't respond to it, you harden your heart. And I believe after all this preaching, they hardened and hardened and hardened their heart that I don't even think when it began to rain that there was any repentance from these people. In fact, I believe they probably felt that that God was being unfair and they began to curse Him even. The violence, the cursing of God as it began to rain and those floodwaters rose. Now, that's just a personal feeling. I don't have any scripture to back that. But that's what I believe was happening. And remember, this was not God acting on a whim. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20 said that God's patience waited in the days of Noah while that ark was being prepared. He continually reached out to these people. Now, I have gone into hospitals and I have visited men and women. In fact, one time... Uh, If you ever ask me to go to the hospital, visit someone, you're going to hear me say today, I won't go unless I know that person knows that I'm coming and they want me to come. One time I was asked to go and visit a man in a hospital. I walked in and introduced myself and the guy went ballistic on me. He did not want to see a pastor. Even though he may be facing eternity, his bitterness and his anger was still, still so strong. And his family thought, well, Let's send Mike. Give it to Mikey. He'll eat anything. (laughs) And the guy started just going screaming at me and started calling for the nurse. And how embarrassing is that? I'm out of the room going, no, I didn't pinch him. You know, I didn't turn off the machine. I didn't do anything. And man, I was so embarrassed. But his bitterness was that strong. Facing eternity. He was yelling at me and throwing me out of uh, and and cursing his family in front of me. He was angry at them for sending me uh, to visit him. And I believe that that's what was happening at that time, that people's hearts were so bitter against God. But God has spoken through His apostles. He has spoken through the prophets. He has spoken through pastors. He has spoken through lay people such as you. From the pulpits to street corners, from harvest crusades to a desk sitting across from the unbeliever. God is speaking to people today. That call is going out. Now, how good of a preacher are you in your life? Are you looking for the opportunities to share the love of God with those that are around you? That's an important part of this. As in the days of Noah, only those who enter the ark through the redeeming blood of Christ is going to be saved. Now, on the very same day that Noah and Noah's sons, verse 13, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his son with them entered the ark, They and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they all went into the ark to Noah, two by two, of all flesh, in which is the breath of life. So that those that entered, male and female, and of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, And the Lord, you might under that line that in your Bible, the Lord shut him in. It's the one, the Lord, who's going to shut that door. It's the Lord who's going to make the decision when that day is going to happen when it's too late. It's not going to be you. It's not going to be me. It's going to be the Lord. Now, notice that the Lord does not say that there are other doors. In John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find the pasture. Speaking of people being like sheep, a pasture is a place where you find rest and safety and food and health. Anyone who will come through that door. You try any other door, he says you're like a thief and a robber. And so there are those who try to enter into heaven by other means. But Christ is the one that is that door. He is the one who will shut the door. Now, the flood was on the earth for 40 days. 
The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all of the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward. Remember, a cubit was about the distance from your elbow to the tip of your finger. So we're talking in the neighborhood of 18 inches. So 15 cubits upward and the mountains were completely covered. So here, the waters came from above. That was that we spoke of before, that canopy of water that God had suspended in space to protect the earth from radiation and shield the earth. All of that came down from the heavens as a very, very heavy rain. And also, there were rivers, it says, in the gardens that went out out of the garden and split into four different rivers. You remember the Euphrates was one of them we talked about, these large rivers. Well, they were fed through these underground taverns or caves and of, of water, and all of this broke forth out from the ground. So water's coming down from above and water's rising up from below. And they call these below waters fountains of the deep. Now it's interesting to note that scientists have discovered these great charcoal beds under the ice in the area of the South Pole. Now how on earth did a charcoal bed get there? Well, this is made from vast forests. That would have been underneath the ground there and frozen over and it would make this charcoal bed. They have also found green grass and vegetation in the mouths of these woolly mammoths out in Siberia. Frozen tundra out there. And yet they've got green grass in their mouth and and this vegetation. How did that happen? Well, I believe this is all part of the flood. Now, there are those who believe that the flood was a localized thing. But if that's the case, and my question comes, why did Noah build an ark for a hundred years then? Why didn't Noah spend 40 years just walking to the other side of the continent and get away from it and go out in the Mojave Desert or something? Why would he spend 120 years building an ark? Wouldn't God just say, you know what, I'm going to have a mountain I want you to go and spend some time there because it's going to get ugly around here. And the earth is going to be covered in this area if it was a localized thing. But it makes it clear that this water rose above the earth. That the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, above all the high hills. That makes it clear to me that it was the whole earth. Now, the waters prevailed 15 cubits upward and the mountains were covered, it says. All flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man. This is a sad moment right here on, in heaven and on earth. Imagine how heaven grieved at this time as the Lord had made man, how the Lord loved man and made him in his image. And I believe that you could only imagine here the rejoicing that would have taken place in hell as the devil felt the taste of victory that day. Maybe he finally thought that he did wipe out that seed of Eve that was promised to bring forth the Messiah. But the devil is not all-knowing. God has always got a plan that's greater than the devil's. And God did have a plan. And the devil did not get his way. All those, it says in verse 22, I want you to please note that or underline it. All in whose nostrils was the breath of the Spirit of life. All that was on the dry land died. I'll give you a history lesson here if you're a history buff. I don't know how many of you might have heard of the Scopes Monkey Trial. But in March of 1925... There's a man named John Scopes that was involved in this trial. It all began in Tennessee as the state legislature passed a bill called the Butler Act. It was authored by a man named John Butler. And this new law barred any public teacher in the state from teaching the theory of evolution. Boy, that wouldn't happen today, would it? 
Now, the penalty for breaking this law could go up to as, as high as $500. So, in 1925, that was a lot of money. The American Civil Liberties Union was quick to react to the statute because it believed it to be unconstitutional. And so they considered this Butler Act a perfect chance to strike out against the literal teaching of this Christian fundamentalist. And they offered then to defend any teacher who would challenge this law. They would defend him for free. Well, this man, John Scopes, he was 24 years old. He was basically a football teacher. But he would substitute teach in the classroom from time to time. And he was asked to teach a biology class. And he used as his text while teaching a book called A Civil Civic Biology by George William Hunter. It's a pro-evolutionary textbook. And so in a setup basically sponsored by a town atheist, they invited the Scopes to a barber shop told them what their plan was, that they were trying to set this thing up to get it to go to court. And he agreed with it, and they had the constable come and arrest him for preaching or or for teaching out of this evolutionary textbook. It was all a setup. And so, sure enough, the American Civil Liberties Union stepped in and said that they would back him. And so John Scopes then was put on trial, so to speak. Well, in this setup... There were two men who faced off in court, one being for evolution and the other one for creation. There was a legendary criminal defense lawyer by the name of Clarence Darrow, known as the greatest attorney alive during that era. And he was a self-proclaimed agnostic. On the other side was a Christian fundamentalist by the name of William Jennings Bryan. I don't know that I would have picked this man to have represented the court, but... That seems to be always how it goes. They find some guy that doesn't represent the true word of God and they put him in there. But in the courtroom, Clarence Darrow begins to humiliate uh, Brian by asking him if he believed every word in the, in the Bible. Brian said that he did. So Darrow asked him this question regarding Noah's flood. And he said, then how did the fish drown? Well, he didn't have an answer. And so he gave this great confusing speech that went nowhere and it brought about nothing but a bunch of laughter and mocking from the people that were there listening. So Brian, who began his testimony calmly, began to stumble under Darrow's attacks. And at one point, Brian spoke out. Now, listen to what he said. This this is a man representing the church here. He says, "I, I don't think about things that I don't think about. And so Darrow responds and says, well, do you think about the things you do think about? And he responded and said, well, sometimes. Brilliant. That's brilliant. That's a man I would want to have represent me in court. Well, the skirmish between these two men lasted for about two hours before the judge finally stepped in and just put a stop to it. At the end of that, he had ordered just, the judge ordered the court adjourned for the day. And the next day... The judge ruled that William Bryan could not return to the stand and that his testimony the previous day should be stricken from evidence. So the confrontation between these two men was reported by the press as a complete and total defeat for this man, Bryan. According to one historian, it says, As a man and as a legend, Bryan was destroyed by his testimony that day. His performance was described as that of a pitiful, punch-drunk warrior. Now, the sad thing is, is this man not only had to live that kind of reputation, but six days later, he was glutting his face with food and he laid down to take a nap and he died. Now, no one knows who would have won this historic debate in the end, but if Brian knew his Bible better, he would have known that here the Scripture says that it only speaks of animals with the breath of life in them on dry land that were going to die. All he would have had to have said is the fish weren't going to die. And that would have ended that part of the debate. Verse 23 says, He destroyed all living things that were on the face of the ground. Both the man and the cattle, the creeping things, and the birds of the air, they were all destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth for 150 days. Now you do the math. That's six months. Does anybody here want to be on board 
a wood boat with a bunch of stinky animals for six months. I mean, we complain about having to live with our relatives for six months, and he had to do that too, you know. After our car accident, I was confined to a chair for five months. I sat in it, I ate in it, I slept in it. I couldn't move from that chair. I couldn't lay flat at all. Now, that was difficult. But the hardest part during that time wasn't so much the pain that I suffered, although that was there. But it was just being so stir-crazy. Most men, and you women can contest to this, we don't like to just sit in a chair and, and you know, watch Judge Judy all day long. That's just not what we're made of, and we don't want to do that. And so I would beg my family, my wife, my anybody, just take me out for a while. Now, the sad part is I'd get down the street and I'd have to turn around and come back because I couldn't take it. I couldn't even sit in a, in a car seat for very long. But you can only imagine how bad this must have been for Noah and his family. I can't imagine what it's like being stuck inside that ark, just bobbing around in the water for six months. Well, it didn't end there. So we're going to read on here further in as we go into other chapters that there's this receding time of the water and there's a testing of sending the birds out and coming back. And all of this had to take place before they could finally actually get out of this thing and get on dry ground. So this was a real lesson in patience for Noah's family. Now that's something to think about today. You didn't think I was going to teach on patience, did you? And no one wants to hear a message on that. But I'm going to tell you this right now. Whether you ask for it or not, God's going to give it to you. So you might as well go ahead and pray and, and consider patience. Because that's what God wants to do in our life. He wants to mature us. And if you take note, most people that you know that are really mature Christians... They are patient people because they have gone through their life learning the lessons that you're having to learn, too. And God doesn't move immediately. God's not jack in the box. You don't order it at this window and get angry because you have to wait for two cars to move out of your way to get to that window and get your food so you can eat. That's not how God functions. It seems like a terribly long time, but the alternative for them was worse. And I believe the trials and difficulties that we go through sometimes feel like they're forever. But let me tell you, the alternative is worse also. Learn from the things that you go through. God wants to teach you how to trust in Him, how to rely on Him, how to cling to Him. And we just don't want to do that. But we need to be more like the animal world. We don't need to be man that looks like the mule. But like the sparrow to the robin, we need to be able to put our trust in the Lord today and believe what He says because He says what He means. And we need to be actively moving, I think, as we are in chapter 7. I think the day is coming soon when the Lord is coming back. We need to let our light shine before man. And so it's a perfect time. A lot of people are willing to maybe go to church at Christmas and maybe at Easter so we need to be praying. Well, it's just not in me to do that kind of thing. It's not in me either. But pray and see if the Lord puts it on your heart to maybe just walk down a few doors of your neighborhood and introduce yourself to probably a neighbor you've never even met and invite them. Ask them to be your guest and to come with you. Uh, I'm not going to say that our sunrise service or even our Sunday morning services here is the answer. They need Jesus, not church. They need Jesus not Calvary Chapel. But we need to reach out to them and let them know about Jesus through our life. Amen?